Hello friends, after two days of endometriosis, today I have come up with an obstetric topic. I always say that OBGYN is a complete subject because we have medicine in it, surgery in it, imaging science, a little bit of pediatrics, neonatology, and overall, we have got obstetrics. Obstetrics is so interesting and diabetes and preeclampsia are the most important two medical disorders that we have to deal in obstetrics or during pregnancy. Glycemic control in pregnancy is a very, very important topic, both for the PGs who are appearing for exams, as well as for the practicing obstetricians. So let's straight away get into the topic because it's huge. I'll be talking about not only the insulin, oral anti-diabetic agents, and under insulin, I will be talking also about the analogs and then the newer advances in the management of glycemic control. So I don't think I'll be able to finish in one class. So I've already put it as part one. I hope to complete by tomorrow. Let's see. Usually for undergraduates, I take three to four classes uh, uh, to cover GDM. So today, I will not be going into the other details of GDM. I will just straight away go to the management of it. That is glycemic control. Why glycemic control is important? Strict control of sugars throughout pregnancy is imperative to decrease the incidence of maternal ketoacidosis, fetal anomalies, macrosomia, fetal death, and even after birth, there can be neonatal morbidity. Each medical disorder has a single theme of its management or control. For example, the main aim of antenatal care in preeclampsia is prevention of eclampsia. The main aim of management of heart disease in pregnancy is prevention of cardiac failure. Similarly, it's not just one aim in the management of GDM or diabetes during pregnancy or hyperglycemia during pregnancy is a better terminology, whether it is due to ODM or GDM. It's basically to prevent maternal complication, that is ketoacidosis, but mostly the fetal problems such as anomalies in the first trimester, macrosomia in the second and third trimester, fetal death mainly in the third trimester, and even after birth, neonatal morbidity. Before I get into the control of it, let us understand why it is so important and so difficult. It is difficult because pregnancy itself is a diabetogenic state. Let us look at this. This slide explains everything. And it's a very important slide in the etiopathogenesis of maybe GDM. Placental hormones such as human placental lactogen, estrogen, and progesterone, these are the hormones they will block insulin receptors. As a result, there will be increased insulin resistance. So it is very clear now why suddenly even a young lady should have diabetes when she becomes pregnant. It's because of these additional hormones she will gain during pregnancy. These hormones will also stimulate increased lipolysis as a result, there will be increased free fatty acids, which will be converted into glucose. So it will be a double pronged attack by these placental hormones. Now, increase in glucose will obviously ask for more insulin to maintain the glucose homeostasis, but that will lead to hunger and patient tends to eat more. So when she eats more, obviously, again, the glucose increases and the whole thing will circulate like a vicious circle. Before I get into the control, one more thing I want to deal is the prevention aspect of it. Whether GDM can be prevented. There's a larger question whether diabetes can be prevented. Many people say you may not be able to prevent, but you can always postpone diabetes, coming off diabetes. What about GDM, the diabetes that occurs during pregnancy? Many things have been tried. I will just cover it in three slides. The Cochrane Review of 2014 
on the probiotics to prevent GDM said that they have the potential to change a person's metabolism. And so theoretically, they should be able to prevent GDM. Only one RCT was there involving 256 women who took probiotics from early pregnancy. What they observed was GDM reduced by two thirds. That's quite good. And babies weighed 127 grams lesser. So no macrosomia. No differences in rates of miscarriage, intrauterine death, neonatal death, whatever I described in the first slide were almost similar. And no data on macrosomia, caesarean deliveries. With regards to myoinositol, many people, at least the company, promotes this as one of the good insulin sensitizers, and hence it should be able to prevent GDM. Myonacetol is a naturally occurring sugar found in cereals, corn, green vegetables, and meat that has a role in the body's sensitivity to insulin. Four RCTs, 567 women, intervention from 11 to 24 weeks, associated with reduction in GDM, but low quality evidence, it shows promise in preventing GDM, but there is not enough evidence at this stage. That was in 2015, but I have not seen anything after that. There was one study from India, but again, it was a very small study. There is potential benefit for reducing the incidence of gestational diabetes. That is the conclusion by the Cochrane Review. Trials are not powered to detect differences in primary or secondary outcomes, including parental mortality and serious infant morbidity. But what was interesting that all studies were from Italy, hence you cannot generalize them or you cannot take it globally. Yes, these are the only three slides on prevention of GDM. Now, let me talk on the glycemic control in pregnancy. Before that, let us see what are the usual treatment options that we have. One is diet, of course. The other one is exercise. But usually we say diet plus exercise, and this is a default. What it means is there is no need to ask anybody whether we should prescribe diet and exercise. It is default. Default means diet and exercise is a must. In addition to this, you may give other things. So these two are taken for granted. Okay? So... What diet, I'm going to talk in detail. What exercise, of course, not heavy exercise during pregnancy, just walking is good enough. To this, we have to add drugs. And drugs, again, it could be oral anti-diabetic agents, OADs, or it could be insulin or a combination of all of that. So now I will talk about diet mainly. What are the modifiable risk factors? Diet, of course, low fiber and high glycemic load. Physical inactivity. This can be changed. Lifestyle interventions can prevent type 2 diabetes. These interventions may help prevent GDM also. So from the knowledge that we have gained in the prevention of type 2 diabetes, the same can be extrapolated for prevention of GDM during pregnancy. But as I said, physical activity cannot be very strenuous during pregnancy. Based on current data, conclusive evidence is not available to guide practice. So when you talk about diet, actually one goes really, uh, what do you say, uh, confused. So many diets are there. So many types of prescriptions are there. So let us see what has been the Cochrane Review. 11 different dietary advisors were assessed with six different comparisons. I do not want to spell out each one of them. As you can see here, low to moderate glycemic index diet versus high mixed glycemic index diet, low glycemic index versus high fiber, energy restricted versus no energy restriction, low carbohydrate versus high carbohydrate, high monosaturated versus high carbohydrate and ADA diet versus fiber and rich diet. 
So what is the conclusion? No significant benefits of the diets investigated. So there is no need to be fastidious about diet. We all know about diet. It is very difficult to thirst upon any type of diet on any individual, especially during pregnancy. During pregnancy, lady has her own choices. First of all, she cannot eat many, many things during pregnancy. On top of that, if you say that you have to take this or that, it will become very, very difficult for her. So what we can make a simple formulation is that she can eat whatever she has been eating, maybe a just modification, and maybe she has to you know, slightly reduce the quantity. Again, remember, during pregnancy, you cannot restrict diet also. While you cannot do strenuous exercise, you cannot restrict diet too much. If you restrict diet too much, then the baby will suffer. This is the, this is the biggest challenge for all obstetricians. I, that's exactly why obstetrics is so challenging, so wonderful, and so interesting. We have to always walk a tight rope. We cannot err on the side of mother, nor can we err on the side of the baby. We have to make that balance. If you deliver too early, then there will be a preterm baby. If you deliver too late, then there will be a problem for the baby as well as to the mother. So that's the balance. Even in life also, one who knows what is optimum is the winner. So we can ask her to have things in moderation. What is that moderation? Calorie-wise, 35 kilocalories if the lady has got low BMI. But as the BMI increases, you have to cut down the calories 30 and then to 25. But you should never go for highly restricted diet. Usually what I say is 2,000 kilocalories is good. You don't go for, you know, crash diet, of course, is not at all advisable because many people think that the moment we say diabetes, they immediately relate themselves with the diabetes that occurs later in life. We need to clarify. We need to talk to the patients very clearly that the GDM is different from the type 2 diabetes that they get in life, unless the lady was already a case of ODM. That happens nowadays because many a times they uh, become pregnant very late in life or maybe the second and third time when they become pregnant, they are already crossing the age of 30, 35, and that's the time when they have to get the type 2 diabetes. I'm not going into the details of what is GDM, what is ODM, and all that today. I will simply talk about the glycemic control because that is another uh, full length class by itself. Maybe I will take some other time. Diet composition, as I said, any diet is okay, so don't be very fastidious. But rough guidance will be carbohydrate 50 to 60 percent because you need energy, you need direct energy. That's why, uh, you know, total restriction of carbohydrate during pregnancy is definitely not advisable. Maybe uh, when you are contesting for a beauty contest or when you're going for a sports and things like that, you may want to totally avoid carbohydrates and you may want to go for protein and other things. But during pregnancy, it is not advisable. Protein, definitely you need for the baby which is going to grow. Baby requires protein, a lot of proteins. So mother also should take at least 20% of the diet should be protein. And fat also is required 25%. So she has to probably take care of the portions rather than on the composition. Adequate fiber is important because as it is, constipation is very common during pregnancy. So adequate fiber, fruits, uh, whatever fruits she likes. Now, don't prescribe a particular fruit. Usually that's the thing. You know, uh, everybody is so, so actually uh, worked up about the diet. The moment we say you have to eat fruit, then they will ask uh, the fruit that is not available early. Should I eat that? So I'll say whatever fruit is available in the market, you eat that. And some people uh, come up uh, after searching in the Google, they say we have to eat five colored fruit. Okay, five colored fruit, if you get, it's very good. And uh, if, uh, if, if the husband is around, I'll say, don't worry, your husband is so good, he can even get you the tiger's milk. So he will get you whatever fruit you like. So usually they ask us what they like. Uh, and uh, if you say, don't eat that, don't eat this, then they will not like it. So they will probably ask questions in different ways till you say yes. So it is better to say yes to whatever they ask for because that's 
at least something which you can eat during pregnancy, but you just tell them to be careful in the portion or in the quantity. After talking so much about the diet, I don't want to talk really much about exercise. Let me straight away go into the drugs, that is uh, pharmacotherapy, OEDs and insulins. Now comes the debate, whether OED or insulin. Of course, I have given many lectures and I thought the debate is uh, almost settled, but uh, those who have not heard me earlier, so let me explain this again. Whenever you want to choose something, whether, uh, uh, whether it is surgery or medicine, I told you the other day, uh, the basic principle, how to choose surgery and medicine. Something which is structurally changed, you need surgery. Something which is functionally deranged, you need medicine. That's the basic principle. Now, when it comes to medicine, again, in, in, the, in, the, in the topic of diabetes, the question comes whether to take injectables or whether to take OADs or whether to take you know, insulin sensitizers or whether to directly give insulin. Now, the basic question, let us understand the principles behind treatment. The basic question, question before any treatment is that, what is the problem, right? So you need to understand what is the problem here and what's the cause of the problem. So you have to understand what is, what is giving rise to this particular problem. Is it an infection or is it a derangement of some chemicals in the body, whether it's a derangement of the hormone? And the next question would be, can we treat that cause? Can we reverse the cause? Can we make good for the cause? Now, if you can't treat the cause, for example, let's say we know corona is because of uh, the COVID-19 um, coronavirus. We know the cause, but we cannot probably uh, you know, take care of that cause, but we can at least treat the problem, isn't it? We can treat, uh, supportive treatment can be given, we can give, so similarly, even in preeclampsia, we don't know the exact cause of preeclampsia, but we are treating cases of preeclampsia. We are bringing down the BP and we are actually taking care of the convulsions or we can at least prevent the convulsions. And if nothing can help us, we at least know we can deliver and take care of the mother. So that is the uh, thing what I'm trying to say here. Now let us apply this general formula into our GDM or diabetes. So whenever there's hyperglycemia of pregnancy, what is the problem? We know the problem. The problem is insulin resistance. I explained that to you nicely in my that slide where that's, you know, the wheels were, uh, you know, revolving. Not so much of depletion of insulin. See, diabetes can be because of two reasons. One is the insulin goes down. It could be, you know, like uh, you know, early onset diabetes or primary diabetes, whereas the secondary diabetes is usually a combination of both insulin going down as well as ins insulin resistance, isn't it? So that's the type 2 diabetes. Whereas in pregnancy, it is mostly insulin resistance. It's mostly insulin resistance because the patient is young. The pancreas are not been uh, exhausted yet unless there was some pancreatic problem. So the main problem is insulin resistance, not so much of depletion. Why I'm harping on this? Because logically, the treatment has to be against this, isn't it? So what is the cause of this? We already know pregnancy hormones, as I told you, HPL, estrogen, progesterone. Okay. Can we treat the cause? No, we cannot treat the cause unless we deliver her. Of course, that's the last one. Same as in case of preeclampsia. Delivery will take care of the problem, but sometimes GDM, there are two types of GDM. One is, which is first recognized. Second one is onset variety. Onset variety is because of pregnancy. First recognized is incidental to pregnancy. The first recognized variety, even if you deliver, may continue after the pregnancy because that's incidental to pregnancy. Can we treat the problem? Yes, of course, we can treat the problem even before delivery. So what is a logical treatment? Logical treatment has to be insulin sensitizer. So I hope you understood this. Now, when I was undergraduate, we actually were taught that insulin sensitizers, mostly the oral hypoglycemic agents, are contraindicated. And they stressed so much about the teratogenicity of it, 
they told about the long term acting uh, uh, part of it saying that that is the one problem which we cannot adjust properly insulin is the one which we can adjust readily and all those things for a long long time we thought oral hypoglycemic agents are no no but this particular study 2008 it's a old study but it's a landmark study and it has come in the new england journal of medicine so this study actually totally revolved our understanding and made all the changes metformin versus insulin for the treatment of gestational diabetes there are many landmark studies in fact manipal pgs have requested me to give a talk on landmark studies there are and that was a question long question in one of the question papers i'm going to take a class on that landmark studies in obstetrics and gynecology so this is one of them and which told us the primary outcomes 363 metformin in the metformin group 370 in the insulin group severe hypoglycemia was less common in metformin you know metformin is a long acting agent so it will not suddenly bring down the uh, uh, glucose levels that is the actually an advantage you know as i said we have to uh, walk a very tight rope isn't it in pregnancy if you bring down the glucose levels suddenly the baby will suffer actually sometimes there can be sudden iud because of hypoglycemia so you want the sugars to be low but not so low same as we say we want the hypertension to be low but not very low if the hypertension is brought down very low and suddenly the baby can suddenly die of hypertension the blood will not reach the baby because there is vasospasm so vasospasm is actually a defense mechanism to ensure that the baby gets the blood now here if you bring down the blood pressure by other means then the baby will suffer same way when the baby is used to so much of free sugars from the mother and if you suddenly bring down the sugars by giving insulin baby will suffer so that danger is avoided in metformin because it will never bring down the blood pressure or it will never cause severe hyperglycemia also when you give metformin the only perinatal loss incidentally was in insulin group surprising is it it it's not so surprising to me because insulin probably would have brought the sugar so low that the baby had suddenly death other composite complications were almost similar like maybe other things secondary outcomes when women in the metformin group had faster accomplishment of glucose targets over a period of time it's like you know marathon runners they run slowly but they will actually win the goal whereas the sprinters they will run fast they will win the 100 meters race but they will not win the marathon race similar maternal hypertensive complications and lesser weight gain between the time of enrollment and 36 weeks now this is very interesting what happens when you give metformin is that to the mother as it is metformin has got gi uh, uh, you know uh, complete side effects so she will tend to eat a little bit less and it is not like a hormone isn't it so it's a, just an insulin sensitizer so it will just do that job of pushing the glucose into the cells at the peripheral level whereas when you give insulin insulin is like a growth hormone you must have seen this when even the adults when they are given insulin they tend to put on weight little bit initially because that's like a growth hormone that will increase the appetite and things like that so when you put the patients on metformin there was lesser weight gain between the time of enrollment and 36 weeks greater weight loss lesser weight gain is one thing greater weight loss between time of enrollment and the postpartum visits again for the same reason that's why many people you know in pcos they give metformin as a weight reducing pill and in that lecture i have cautioned don't use metformin as a weight reducing pill it is not actually going to reduce the weight the way because weight reduction is here mainly because patients may not be eating well due to the side effects and this problem will be overcome after 6 to 7 months by by the time she would have delivered in adults when you give metformin initial 3 to 6 months you think that the person is losing weight that's mainly because of the gi uh, you know side effects but after that the weight gain will, weight loss will not occur it will stabilize so metformin 
even though there is lesser weight gain or greater weight loss should not be in construed as a weight reducing pill what we should understand it as when you give insulin there can be weight gain that's how we should understand it first line therapy acog came out with a clear guidelines even much before this uh, cochrane review in 2013 itself insulin and oids are equal in efficacy full stop so you can use either of them uh, as a first choice either can be used as the first line therapy so whenever there is an indication to start pharmacotherapy you can either choose insulin or oids uh, with equal efficacy well i will tell you there are still 30% of the patients who may require additional insulin even if you start them with oids which are those patients i am going to tell soon there was one more systematic review which came in 2009 uh, uh, meta analysis again this was uh, benefit and risk of oral diabetic agents compared with insulin in gdm a systematic review the conclusions were four rcts and five observational studies no significant difference in glycemic control that means it's as good no increase in acute or short term adverse maternal neonatal outcome both can be considered for glycemic control in women with gdm probably that new england journal 2008 and this particular article stimulated or rather made acog come up with that guideline oid for odm or gdm odm means patient was diabetic before becoming pregnant there is evidence to use oid in pre existing diabetes mellitus previous gdm current impaired glucose tolerance all of them larger trials comparing combination reporting on maternal and infant health outcomes and long term outcomes of course were required that was the conclusion in 2010 subsequently in 2015 a systematic review was done which was published in british journal of clinical pharmacology metformin versus insulin for gestational diabetes this was definitely required because 2008 10 and then acog guideline in 2013 this study was this meta analysis clearly looked into the problem conclusions were metformin is better in terms of glycemic control almost echoing of the same conclusions safer in terms of preeclampsia incidence similar efficacy and safety in terms of neonatal hypoglycemia the frequency of large for gestational age infants that means there is no macrosomia rds and phototherapy and perinatal death so in other words metformin was given at least distinction marks and they said it can be used there was one more review article which came in australia new zealand journal short and long term outcomes of metformin compared with insulin alone in pregnancy also 2015 conclusions were no difference in glycemic control between metformin and insulin groups those receiving metformin recorded less maternal weight gain a number of studies reported lower rates of neonatal hypoglycemia full marks again and finally another article before i get into the actual treatment i would like to do this review also australia news and journal comparison of neonatal outcomes in gdm with moderate hyperglycemia on metformin or glibenclement now here both of them are ads that is uh, oral ods oral anti diabetic agents there is no comparison with insulin here metformin versus glibenclement so let's see composite of neonatal outcomes that is macrosomia hypoglycemia need for phototherapy respiratory distress still birth or neonatal death and birth trauma were seen in 35% of glibenclamide group so not so good compared to metformin which was only 18.9% so metformin is the clear winner again neonatal hypoglycemia in glibenclamide group was higher that is 12.5 versus none in metformin group so clear winner is metformin again what about the secondary outcomes that 
such as birth weight, maternal glycemic control, preeclampsia, preterm birth, need for induction of labor, mode of delivery, and complications of delivery. All these were similar in both groups, not so much of difference, of course. One more systematic review, short and long-term outcomes of metformin compared with insulin alone in pregnancy, 2016. Conclusions were metformin had no short-term adverse effects on pregnancy, potential benefits in the neonatal period, but limited long-term follow-up information, obviously. Now it's been only six years. Oral medications for GDM in general, the current choice of OAD therapy appears to be based on good evidence, clinical preference, availability, and neonatal guidance. So who is saying this? Cochrane. When? 2017. So no doubt should be there anymore. Further research is of course needed to assess the potential harms of one OAD compared to another. That means metformin versus glibenclamide and other things. Of course, metformin has proven itself enough and more, so we are, should not hesitate to use that. What are the general advantages of OADs? Of course, they are oral, so convenient intake, no multiple injections, no pain, and no need to refrigerate like we have to do with insulin. And we have to sometimes train either the patient or the patient party to give injections, all those things extra. They are cheaper, obviously, compared to insulin. That's why there's wider acceptance. No, they do not cause maternal obesity. I've told you already why and how. Obesity causes macrosomia independent of maternal hyperglycemia. We all know this. Obese mothers will have big babies. Obese mothers will have difficulty in labor. Obese mothers will have more incidence of cesarean section. It is independent of diabetes and macrosome due to diabetes. So this is a direct correlation of maternal weight gain and macrosome. They promote weight loss also. Uh, there's a double lose weight. So it's just promote weight loss. Do not cause fetal macrosomia. Again, that is repeated here. So either because of obesity in the mother or because of hyperglycemia induced hyperinsulinemia in the fetus, which gives rise to macrosemia, both will not happen. So because they do not stimulate the fetal pancreas. Hyperglycemia in pregnancy is not just due to GDM. That's what I want to tell before I go into the actual treatment. It could be due to continuation of over diabetes in pregnancy. So ODM. So those who are ODM, of course, before advising pregnancy, they, the sugar should be well controlled, but these are the patients who will quickly get into GDM mode when they become pregnant because already as it is, they have got a little bit of depletion of insulin. When they become pregnant, they will have additional insulin resistance. So they will be worse. Hence, insulin is also needed. So I was telling you uh, just a few minutes ago that who are those patients who require additional insulin in spite of treating them initially with metformin? I told you 30% of the patients who may require additional insulin. So you start with metformin, no problem. But as you treat, you will realize that to one level, the sugars come down. After that, the sugars don't come down. And that's the time you may have to add insulin for them. Threshold for initiating pharmacotherapy. The old criteria was that uh, Priscilla Wedge classification GDM A2 variety, that is fasting blood sugar more than 105 milligrams per DL or any value more than 200 milligrams per DL. But the new one, that is ACOG ADA criteria, says fasting more than 95. One hour PPBS more than 140. We don't do one hour in Manipal. We do only two hours, but some centers do that. That's why I've given this value. Whereas two hour PPBS is 120. Easy to remember two hour value. Two hour con consists of 120 minutes. So the sugar should be 120 milligrams per day. Suppose you say we can't remember so many things. If you want to just remember two things, then it is fasting more than 95 
and two hours more than 120. So they definitely require pharmacotherapy. I am not seeing insulin. I am seeing pharmacotherapy. So that pharmacotherapy to start with can be metformin or insulin, better metformin. Another thing, suppose the patient was PCOS before becoming pregnant and she underwent infertility treatment. And during ovulation induction, suppose the patient was on metformin, there is a case to continue metformin. That's debatable. Uh, earlier, they used to say you continue metformin at least till first trimester to prevent abortion, but that is also a question now. There is no point in continuing metformin in them to prevent GDM. You may stop actually metformin after at least 12 to 14 weeks, but if those patients develop later in pregnancy, around let's say 30 weeks, 32 weeks, if they develop GDM, those are the patients who would be definitely benefited by metformin. So you always uh, start with metformin. I think I'll stop the class here and I will start with the classification of OADs tomorrow. Um,